and welcome to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast, the world's largest weekly podcast dedicated to the topic of leadership. My name is Scott Miller, and I'm privileged to serve as your ongoing host and interviewer. Today we have the world's most renowned thought leader and expert on small business, known as the small biz lady, Melinda Emerson, who is the book author of Become Your Own Boss in 12 Months, a month-by-month guide to a business that works today. Melinda, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. Melinda, you are a renowned podcast radio host. You're a coach, you're an expert counselor, you are a keynote speaker, you're an author, you have online courses. You're known as one of the nation's, if not the nation's top leadership expert when it comes to small business, side hustles, things like that. Today, we're gonna talk about all things entrepreneurship, solo entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship. Now, most of our listeners are in leadership capacities. They often work for large or mid-sized organizations. But what we all have in common is, I'll bet, a secret or not-so-secret desire to be our own boss, to open our own business, if not as a full-time gig or a leap of faith, perhaps uh, to dip our toes in the shallow end of the water as a entrepreneur or even a side hustle, which is becoming more and more common and not just acceptable, but you know, normal for most people to have some kind of side hustle. Melinda, before we get into the book and some of your expertise, which is so practical, will you reorient our listeners and viewers from around the world on what has been your journey and how you became the small biz lady? Well, I have to tell you, Scott, I'm an accidental business coach. I went to college at Virginia Tech. I majored in broadcast journalism. When I got out, I got a job as a producer. My second job out of college, I got my dream job, Market for Television in Philadelphia. But you know what happened to me? It's one of those things where you got to be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. I got my dream job when I was 23 years old. And after a couple of years of doing it, I was like, I hate this. <laughs> I got to do something else. And so I started working on my off days for a production company. And, you know, and when I was 26 years old in the middle of February sweeps, I quit my job and started my business. And literally I had a laptop, a fax machine and a dream. (laughs) So I started my business in the basement of my house and built it over time. And eventually I won a business plan competition in Philadelphia that came with $20,000 in free office space as a business incubator for one year. And that's really when my business transitioned from really being a solo business to really getting a team Eventually, my then husband was able to quit his full-time job at GE and join us, and we grew the business to the point where Philly has sort of like a Philly 100 list, almost like the Inc. 5000 list, and my business made number 29 on the fastest growing small businesses list in Philadelphia, but then all of a sudden, I got pregnant with my son, (laughs) and I ended up on bed rest for six months. And this was 2005, 2006. So I want you guys to get in your time machine and go back and remember when Wi-Fi was not in people's houses. So when I got sent home, put on bed rest, oh my gosh, it was like, I realized I had made the number one mistake you can make in business. I had built a business that couldn't run without me. Hmm. And so the year I had my son, I almost lost everything because I was the number one rainmaker in my business. When I wasn't there, that means there wasn't much rain being made. So what I realized in those six months that I was on bed rest at home, I started writing down all of the expensive mistakes I made. And man, the list was like ah, this long. But out of that came my book, Become Your Own Boss in 12 Months. Basically, I wrote the book I had never read because what occurred to me while I was on bed rest getting my son here was that I would have run my business better if I had had better advice. But back then, there wasn't anybody in mainstream media giving people small business advice. I mean, Susie Orman and Jean Chatsky were out here giving people financial advice, but nobody was saying, hey, if you've got an idea, here's the things you need to know. So I decided to put myself in charge of ending small business failure. And thanks to Twitter, where I couldn't get my name, I got the nickname Small Biz Lady. And we now know that that was the best branding thing that ever could have happened to me. Melinda, 
We're going to have a great inspirational conversation today around practically what needs to happen for someone to launch a business. The title of your book is, in fact, the structure of your book and your coaching about how passionate you are around this 12-month runway. I know a few things about books. Look behind me, and I've read a few, written a few, and published a few as well in the 40 years that Franklin Covey's been around, 26 or so that I've been here. Uh, we're going to talk today a lot about practically what to do in these big tranches, Before we get into the inspirational aspect of what it means to launch a business, why don't you sober us up? Talk a bit about some of the statistics around small business and how difficult it is to thrive. Let's kind of get the bad news out of the way, but to use that as a kind of a sobering lens to look through how important it is to follow your 12-month prescription. Uh, Give us the bad news. Well, here's the deal. 20% of businesses will go out of business by their second year of operation. 90% of people go out of business within five years. And a lot of that happens because of poor planning. You know, here's the deal. You have to plan for success. It's not going to just happen to you. And you really do have to save your money and be on top of your finances because the money to start your business is going to come from you, your right or your left pocket. So you have to be financially prepared to go into business because money's going to go out for a long time before it starts coming back in. And you've got to be prepared to still manage your household, have an emergency savings, and really still have the first year of working capital for your business. I mean, Linda, in the book, you really argue that there is a 12-month period, minimally, that people should be planning before they ever consider quitting their job or, you know, launching a serious side hustle. In fact, you might argue that in some cases it's less, depending upon their financial security. In many cases, it's more, right? It's a multi-year planning process to get ready for that. Before we go into the 12-month structure, let's talk about kind of six key insights that you share everybody should be thinking about long before they launch their business. Give us about maybe a minute or two on each of these. First, that you talk about uh, a life plan, a small biz- solid business idea, exceptional credit, a business plan, a supportive family or spouse or partner, and then lastly, faith. First, um, riff on the importance of a life plan. Well, you really need a life plan because you've got to figure out what you want and why you want it. Sometimes you just need to get another job (laughs) because before you get out here and think, I'm going to start a business, that's the answer. What I want you to think through is what do you want your dream life to look like? We work to live our dream life. We don't live to work. So you want to make sure that if your dream is to have a flexible day where you can meet the the school bus every day or go on three or four vacations or work from anywhere, you got to think about that so that you can design a business that will allow you to live that life. The next thing you've got to think about is your business idea. And if just because your friends and your mom and your auntie think it's a great idea, that's not a big enough representative sample. You really need to get out there and test your idea. Talk to some people. Just because you bake great cakes and people love them at holiday time doesn't mean you have enough interest to create a business. And by the way, there's a big difference between baking cakes and running a bakery. So you just want to make sure that you understand and look at your business concept based on what skills you have versus what skills you need to run that particular business. Then it's about the money. You've got to look at your financial position and more importantly, your credit position, because you are your business's credit, especially when you're just starting out. So the higher you can get it, the better, but minimally it's got to be 700 to 750, but honestly, 800 is, 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 amazing, but you definitely don't want to start a business with a bunch of credit card debt and a poor credit score because it's going to follow you and affect every single thing that you do about your business. And then the thing you've got to think about is, do you have, do you have industry experience? It's really important for you to start a business that you know something about. I don't want you to start a restaurant because you like to eat. I want you to start a restaurant because you know something about running a restaurant. And the other thing I want to say is this, an unsupportive spouse can kill a business faster than a bad marketing plan. 
So you need to really assess with your family whether or not this is the right time to start a business. And look, if you're married to somebody that you know is highly risk averse, you need to treat them like they are a banker. I would come at them with a PowerPoint presentation, facts and figures, and most importantly, a deadline for how long you're going to pursue this business because they love you, they support you, but they got a secret calendar counting down to how long your time and money is going to be going to this business. So you've got to be honest with them and honest with yourself about how long it's really going to take. And the last element and probably the most important element is faith. If you have an idea, especially if it's a completely unique idea that people have never heard of, you're going to have to believe in yourself so strongly. And you're going to have lots of naysayers, haters, and people telling you no, but you have to stay steadfast. And one of the most important things I do for my business every day is pray over it. And because my faith has carried me, I know after all of us went through the pandemic, a lot of people went through a lot. And their faith, I'm sure, is what pulled them through and helped them come up with a new idea so that they could maybe remix their business model so that hopefully 2021 was a much better year than 2020. Melinda, well uh, well encapsulated. Thank you for that. I, I think those are, as I was reading your book, rereading it recently, because you have you've, uh, have a new edition out that's revised and updated. I was sitting in bed with my wife next to me. I wasn't telling her what the components of the book were. And I was kind of looking over her thinking, so how supportive is my wife? And how supportive have I, how have I, you know, given her transparency to the business that we both own that I work in and she doesn't because she's, of course, raising our three boys primarily and managing our household. But I kind of got to thinking not only how supportive is she, but how much am I giving her transparency into all sides of the business so she can be supportive and understand what's going well and what's not going well. Great list. Uh, before we get into the 12-month plan, you tell great stories in the book. I love the opening sobering story about, you call her, I think, um, I think you called her Karen, but she, probably the wrong name now, like based on what that's taken on in society, but we'll forgive that. Uh, she's a scarf maker. It's a short story, but it's sobering. Will you recreate that story? Because I think everybody with a side hustle or an entrepreneurial dream can benefit from the lesson from the scarf lady. Sure, sure. So Karen at the time was a name that I, I obviously didn't use the woman's actual name because this is a true story from a business owner that I know. She made beautiful knit scarves and she was in a doctor's office one day and another person that was in the doctor's office said, wow, you know, that is a beautiful scarf. I would love if you would make one for my wife. And so this man got this scarf for his wife for Christmas. The wife loved it. Turns out the wife was a buyer for a major department store and said, you know, went back to the husband and said, hey, you know, I want to talk to this woman. I think I might be able to get her an opportunity with our store. And so she she was, you know, made these scarves in her spare time in her kitchen. She had a full time job and so she got this initial order and the initial order was maybe for like 150 scarves. Now she wasn't used to producing that number of scarves. So she did belong to a knitting group. So she got some friends together and they, you know, sort of like knitted the first order. Well, of course the order was so successful. It sold out. Then she got a much bigger order and then she had to figure out how she was going to mass manufacture her product. And she ended up, finding a manufacturer overseas in China to manufacture her scarves. She, you know, and she had to do all of this very quickly because of course she had a, a very finite amount of time to deliver. So long story short, she found the manufacturer, sent them the money. And when you use a foreign manufacturer, you have to send all the money up front to get your product. So as she's waiting on the product to come, waiting on the product to come, what she didn't count on was the tariffs and fees that she had to pay on top of what she paid for manufacturing to actually get her products in to the country. And she ended up missing her deadline to deliver and ended up losing that opportunity. And that happened simply because she wasn't prepared, didn't do her homework, and she got to learn a lot of really expensive lessons. And so it's, there's a big difference between 
making handcrafted goods and mass manufacturing something. And you really have to do your research and understand that. And that's a perfect example of what can happen to you. So you just have to be prepared and you can't be afraid to ask people for help because there's lots of organizations and people out here who help entrepreneurs so you don't have to go it alone. Uh, Melinda, there's so many great lessons to tease out from this particular story around Karen because uh, as you alluded to, she missed the window as I understand the story, the department store canceled the order. And so this woman now had all this product on her hands, not to mention all the, um, the investment she'd made in it. And I can only imagine this probably sunk her business. Hopefully it didn't. But there's so many lessons to be teased out on understanding your timelines and your cash flow and purchase orders and collecting money up front and all those things like that. Uh, you, your, your book is titled, and much of your coaching is around this 12-month period, so for the millions of budding entrepreneurs that are thinking about, you know, growing their Etsy store, perhaps post-pandemic, I'm not sure we're post-pandemic, but let's pretend we are for a moment, people that have uh, a dream to quit their job, and many do, <laughs> and launch their business, what are some of the most important things that people need to be thinking about on the front side of the 12 months? Give yourself 12 months before you perhaps quit your job. What are the big ideas, the big challenges people need to be thinking about and planning for on the front side of the 12 months? Well, number one, you've got to be thinking about what you want out of your business. Like, what do you want your business to be? Do you want one pizza shop or do you want a chain of pizza shops across the country? You really do have to think through because that's going to make a big difference on what kind of financing you pursue for your business. The next thing you've got to think about is the money. Where are you going to get the money to launch your dream business? Because as I said earlier, the money to start your business is going to come from you. Banks do not loan money to start up businesses. Now, the only exception to that is, is if you buy into a franchise, there's a lot of financing that people can get, particularly if you're credit worthy, you can get financing for a franchise business. But if you have an original idea business, most likely you're going to be bootstrapping it. So you really have to get clear about your financial assets. And one of the things that I like to tell people over the 12 months is the first thing you have to do is cure your addiction to your paycheck. So one of the things I want people to do if they're thinking about starting a business is start saving 30 to 40 percent of every paycheck. Or if you are married, figure out how to live off of one paycheck because that will help you recoil your lifestyle a bit so that you can get ready to start your business. Then it's about your research and doing your homework and making sure that you understand what it takes to run this kind of business. A lot of time I've seen people, particularly people that jump out into franchises, they you know, go from some corporate job to running a franchise, and then they don't realize how much manual labor is involved in running a bakery or running a cleaning company. You know, you have to actually physically pick up the 50 pound bag of flour and bring it in the door. <laughs> like, And if you're not used to physical work and you're used to a job that was more like a knowledge job, you really got to make sure that you understand what's the responsibility of running a seven day a week retail business. And then you've got to really get clear about who your paying customer is. Because one of the things that I think a lot of people make the mistake of is they chase anybody that they think has money as opposed to having a specific niche target customer. And the reason why this is dangerous is because most small business owners have the same two problems, limited time and limited resources. So you wanna pick a marketing target that you can actually hit. And the answer is not, oh, everybody can use this, because if everybody can use it, chances are no one will. And then you really do need a business plan. Now, do you got to write this 40 page manifesto? No. But do you need 10 good pages that's going to describe what your business is, what your value proposition is, how you're going to generate sales and how you're going to deliver your product or service? And what is going to be your follow-up to keep your customers? Yes, you need that. Don't spend more time planning your vacation than how you're going to support yourself and your family financially. And don't let your fear of math be the reason why you do not know how much profit is in every sale. 
The other thing I would say is that I am someone who doesn't believe in people quitting jobs to start businesses. I believe that you should launch while you're still working. And the reason why is because it takes 12 to 18 months for a small business to break even, let alone throw off enough money to replace your corporate salary. So you want to learn on someone else's dime as long as you can. Now, if you're starting a company that directly competes with your employer, obviously you have to quit. But most of you are starting the type of businesses that you can run on your evenings and your weekends, which means you just need to deprive yourself of a little bit of sleep, but you can get it done. And that's the best way to start a business really and to learn. Melinda, I have to confess, when I was reading your book, rereading it, I, I found myself frequently saying, well, that's pretty elementary. And then I thought, oh, but I'm not doing that in my business, and I should. And then I thought, well, that seems like a duh idea, but I know a lot of entrepreneurs that aren't doing that, like the 50-pound sack of flour, right, are not realizing that they can't pick their kids up at school because they can't close shop up for 90 minutes. And I think the beauty of your book and your courses is just the practicality and the wisdom of your nearly 20 years as an entrepreneur and business owner and coach. I want to revisit for a moment the runway, the finances, you're quite prescriptive when it comes to coaching your clients and the readers of your book and the subscribers to your course on how they should get their financial house in order on ter in terms of their debt, their cash flow, their paycheck. Will you revisit that and throw out some numbers, some timelines, some balances on what really people who are thinking seriously about launching into a business, where their financial house should be in order? I thought it was sobering, but also really um, good advice. Well, first of all, you want to get to zero debt. That's the first thing. Now, do I mean your mortgage has to be paid off? No. Do I mean your student loans have to be paid off? No. Those are the kinds of fixed debts that you'll, you'll typically have. But things like car payments, credit cards, you got to get rid of all of that stuff. You have to get yourself down to what I call bare bones bills. And then you have to look at your lifestyle. So if you have a latte a day habit, or if you are every Friday and Saturday night hanging out, guess what? Drinks are cheaper if you pour them yourself, right? So I think we have to get out of our constant consumerism if entrepreneurship is something that you really want to do. Because if you're bootstrapping your own business every dollar counts. And the other thing you've got to get used to is using a budget. Because if you don't use a budget for your household, nine out of 10 times, you're not going to use one for your business. And let me tell you something, successful businesses are run based on up-to-date financial information and people do not spend money that is not in their budget. Yeah. And so you want to really make sure that you understand how money works in your life and in your business. So you wanna make sure, and the reason why you need to pay down all your credit cards is because you may need to use your credit cards as you're launching your business. Before you get a customer, before you get money rolling in, you're gonna to have to figure out where the cash is gonna come from. And let me tell you something, when it comes to dealing with a bank, a bank doesn't even wanna to talk to you until you've been in business for two years and have positive cash flow. And then and only then can you get a line of credit. And typically they're only gonna give you a line of credit for 10 to 15% of your gross revenue. So think about that. If you're only making 100,000, that means you might get 10,000, right? So you really have to position yourself because things happen. The number one thing that small businesses struggle with is getting paid. Collections is your biggest issue. So you need to make sure that you have an emergency savings for your household, but that you have one for your business too, for when you still have to make payroll while you're still waiting on a payment from a customer. So cash flow management is everything, but it starts with how you manage your personal finances because it's going to flow directly into how you manage your business finances. There is no question now from our listeners and viewers why you are America's top expert on small business and known as the small biz lady. Melinda, in your book, you have this very prescriptive 12-month planning process. I'm not going to give it all away because I really think anybody who's interested in pursuing a small business or you're in one should buy this book and perhaps enroll in your courses. We'll talk more about the courses in a moment. Big ideas are around um, get your life plan together 12 months out. 
11 months out, construct a financial plan, think like a business owner, 10 months out, create your business model, 10 months out, line up a lawyer and an accountant, nine months out, who's your target customer, um, your business needs a plan, eight months, getting your financial house together, developing your website, eight months out before you're launching your business, seven months, six months, five months, things like developing a sales process, your social media strategy, setting up shop, building your team, setting up customer service systems. Let's stop there a second. Three months out, you're talking about setting up customer service systems. I mean, I'm now about 13 to 14 months into my own business. Scott Miller Productions. I'm an author, I'm a speaker, I have some career coaching going on. I do a lot of different things, kind of all in the non-competitive with Franklin Covey professional development space, somewhat complimentary even. And, and Franklin Covey, which is my uh, consulting arrangement, knows everything I'm doing, very transparent, it's all very above board. Everything I do, the CEO signs off on. And one of my biggest challenge, of course, is setting up the systems to make sure all my customers are happy and problems are being solved and money's being collected would you riff for a few minutes on what it means three months out to be setting up your customer service systems? The most valuable thing in any business is its customers. But a lot of times, particularly new businesses, focus on chasing new customers as opposed to nurturing existing. Amen. Amen. And the reason why this is a problem is because a new customer is about 5 to 20% likely to do business with you. An existing customer is 60 to 70% likely to buy again. So it is critically important that you engage existing customers, that you have great onboarding processes, and that you have seamless customer service, somebody has a problem, somebody immediately gets back to them. There's people that pick up the phone. I don't know about you, but I can't stand buying something and then find out that they only offer chat <laughs> or like I can't talk to a human and say, hey, I got this and it was broken. Please send me another one, right? So you want to make sure that all of your ways that you take care of customers, whether it's a private Facebook group for customers, or it's an online community, or some kind of whatever your thing is that you do to check on customers, make sure they're okay, who are the people that manage the live chat to make sure all of that stuff needs to be thought through, set up, scripts need to be written, frequently asked questions lists need to be developed long before you open your doors because the number one thing you got to do is keep your customers. It is critical, which is why I pull that out as a separate chapter in the book. Melinda, I'm so glad you reinforced that. I'm sitting here listening to you thinking about, I was raised at Disney, right? The world's best customer service and four years of my career and then 26 years here at Franklin Covey where I think we have extraordinary customer service. And I'm just kind of thinking about all of my customers and what am I doing to make sure I've got systems in place and reaching out to them proactively and talking about how I can support them. Not how I can sell to them, but how I can support them and thank them. E excellent advice. Um, give us some big picture watch outs. 20 years as one of the world's foremost authorities on small business launching sustainability. What are the big mistakes, four or five big mistakes that entrepreneurs, solopreneurs make during this 12 month pre-process? Before they ever open the doors or swipe a credit card or take a sale, what are the big mistakes that people need to be aware of as watch outs before they ever open the doors? And then we'll pivot to what are the mistakes they make once the quote doors are open? First, in the 12 month process, where does it go off the tracks? Well, the number one thing is not being realistic about what their life was gonna be like as an entrepreneur, like really not thinking through the life plan. And I've seen this happen where someone decides they wanna be a caterer and they wanna specialize in weddings but they have small kids who are in a lot of activities that take place on the weekends. Well, the wedding business is real busy between what? April and October. And if you have young kids that are in a lot of activities, that's gonna be in direct conflict with your family. So you've gotta just think through that kind of stuff. 
Or let's say you have aging parents that need more of your attention. Like you, you might have conflicting priorities. And so you really have to think that through. I think the other thing that happens though is I think there's this romanticized view people have of entrepreneurship. Like if they made it in corporate America, how hard could entrepreneurship be? Man, you think you work for a crazy person. Wait till you work for yourself. You have no idea what you're going to do because the thing about entrepreneurship is that it is a spiritual journey as much as it's anything else. You're going to have times when you have to push yourself and then you're going to have other times when you have to stop yourself and you really have to be self-aware and mindful of that. You also have to be mindful about your self-talk. A lot of times people talk themselves out of and into things. And you want to make sure that you're not so hard on yourself because you're going to have an opportunity to learn something every day. And some lessons are going to be more expensive than others, but you just have to be able to keep moving forward and not let a setback become the end of your story. I also think that people don't focus enough on a specific customer. So they chase all these people all over the place. They really what I like to tell people all the time is that who makes more money, your cardiologist or your primary care physician, right? The cardiologist, I know they drive Lamborghinis, okay? Right. <laughs> so what you want to do is figure out how to become the cardiologist for what you do because specialists get to charge more money. So you really have to figure out how you can specialize and really if you have a value proposition that is really going to stick. The other thing I think about business is like some people don't think through strategy when it comes to deciding what business they want to go into. So what happens is one of the things that I learned in business school, and I had a professor who said this, and I just thought it was so completely accurate. He said strategy in a business is about creating something that is not easily duplicatable by someone else. And that's really what it comes down to. The world is still waiting on a better mousetrap. And what people need to do is figure out how they can build that mousetrap. Because if they do, the world will be the path to your door no matter where your door is. Melinda, when someone is la has launched their business, perhaps they've bought your book, they've been to one of your courses, they've done their best to get their debt down and, and collaborate with their partner or spouse, and they've, they've followed your entire process, which is, I mean, not a guarantee for success, but if you follow Melinda's 12-month process, you're going to be 90% there. Fast forward, say someone's doing fairly well. They're 12 months in, they're 14 months in, they're two years in. When something starts to go south that they could have controlled, not a pandemic, not a war, not a recession, which you said something smart in the book. You reminded us that about every 10 years or so, there's some kind of economic correction. And that's not a good investment strategy, but it's a good reminder, right, to ask ourselves, is it time for a correction? When it's going well and it stops or implodes or breaks down and it's something they could have controlled, what have you found is where someone got arrogant or fat and happy or complacent and it's a good watch out. Well, I think there's examples of it all over the place. Like look at what happened to the taxi industry when Uber and Lyft came out. Why did Uber and Lyft have an opportunity? Because taxis were dirty. Their customer service was terrible. They were rude to people and they were gouging people in markets all over the country. So people decided, you know what, I'd rather get in the car with a stranger <laughs> than get in a taxi cab. You know, so I think that when you forget that you are in the service business, that you need to serve and help your customers, you're going to lose. But if that happens and you need to reorient yourself, start by talking to your customers and then talk to your frontline employees. A lot of times it amazes me that corporations will bring in Accenture and, you know, these big Bain, like all these big consulting companies when they didn't bother to do a voice of the customer, a voice of the employee exercise and find out what their frontline customer, their frontline employees ideas were about what could be done to fix the problem. I think one of the things that small business owners make a mistake of is feeling like they have to have all the answers themselves. You don't pull everybody around the table, I mean, even the interns, 
and talk about what's going on and ask if anybody has an idea. You will be amazed the ideas that will come out if you make it a safe space for people to share and say what they think went wrong. Because I think at the end of the day, whenever you are humble and you are transparent, people appreciate that. And especially your employees appreciate it. And they will come through and give you a great idea to turn the ship around. They will. Melinda, as we end, talk about how someone works with you. Other than just reading your books and going to your website and listening to your, your podcasts and such, you've got some courses. Talk a little bit about how someone could perhaps even give as a gift to a spouse or to uh, their student graduating from college or maybe someone on their team that they want to keep inside the company and they recognize the way to keep them in the company is to also help them feed their passion on their side hustle. I think it'd be a great gift for leaders inside organizations to give their teams these, not because you want them to leave, because you want them to stay, but you want them to have their passions and their joys fulfilled on the side. How can someone um, learn more about you and perhaps even take some of your courses? Well, we created Small Biz Lady University earlier this year for that very reason, to really provide an opportunity for small business owners to get professional development, particularly around a lot of these online selling strategies that are really have become kind of tough for people. So we have a course on how to sell and market online, ultimate guide to email marketing, and we have a course on social media selling. These are all six week courses. And of course, I have a 10 week course on how to become your own boss. And so those courses are available through smallbizladyuniversity.com. But then if you just want to reach out to me for speaking or coaching or something like that, all you have to do is go over to succeedasyourownboss.com. And I have over 5,000 articles there about how to start and grow a successful small business. So I'm sure no matter what it is, I've written something about it. So just go to our search bar and search for something and you'll find it for sure. But my mission is to end small business failure. So every week we put out fresh content and a weekly newsletter, giving people tools and tips to live their dream life as entrepreneurs. I'm serious when I say to the millions of business leaders, whether you're in a Fortune 5000 or a Fortune 50, or perhaps you're a small entrepreneur and you've got a dozen employees, I think if you bought this book and gave it to your team members, this says, I care about you. I love you. I want you to be successful. I want you to stay. Now, I recognize you may not stay here 35 years like my father did or 26 years like Scott Miller did, but I want to feed your passions. I want to invest in you. This isn't, I want to get rid of you. This is, I want you to be successful. I want you to take some of the ideas that you learn in this book and employ them in our company, the company that I own. But I recognize that you may also have some entrepreneurial interest in mind. And if you do choose to leave, I want you to be successful because hopefully you might come back someday and be an investor in my business or be a partner in my own business. I think it's a great investment to make in your people, including if it ends up with them uh, finding their joy or deciding that entrepreneurship isn't right for them and they come back and really value you as their employer. So Melinda, thank you for your time. The book is Become Your Own Boss in 12 Months, a month-by-month -month guide to a business that works today. Thank you for joining us. I wish you all the success in the world. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. It's been a wonderful time. And thanks for your time today. We'll see you back next week for an amazing conversation on leadership.